We've been, we've been looking at Paul's second missionary journey. If you remember, he along with Silas, Timothy, and Luke have established the first church in Europe where they had led people to Christ. Remember, in Philippi, that was the first town they went to. And, and, and if you remember, they were preaching the gospel, and this slave girl came up. She had the spirit of divination, this, which is the spirit of the python, which enables her to tell the future. And she's following them, and she's announcing, she's announcing to everyone that these people are bond servants of the Most High God, and they are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Now, you'd think Paul would like that. But everywhere they went, she kept doing it for many days. And she, it became pretty infuriating to Paul. So what did he do? He commanded the spirit to come out of her. And immediately the spirit did come out of her. That was the spirit of the python that came out of her. Now, this pretty much upset the owners of this slave girl. And what did they do? They dragged Paul and Silas to the authorities. And the authorities had them beaten and put in, put in prison. So um, it was, and it was in prison that Paul and Silas are sitting there praising God and singing all these praises. I mean, I mean, having been beaten with rods, that's gotta be tough. But they were, had been beaten and now they're in prison and they're praising God and they're praying and everybody's hearing all this. And then what happened, do you remember? What happened when they were in the prison? An earthquake. There was an earthquake, right. There was an earthquake. And, and this area is known for earthquakes, but this wasn't a normal earthquake, was it? Because the only thing that happened were their chains became unfastened and the doors opened. Okay? Pretty cool. Um, but the, and then the jailer who felt the earthquake came out and he saw that all this had happened. And he knew everybody must have escaped. And what was he going to do? He's going to kill himself. He's going to drop on his sword. And then he hears, he hears Paul cry out, don't harm yourself. We're all still here. And um, none of the prisoners had escaped. And the jailer must have known that these men had some kind of authority because they've been out, he, they've been out the, he's probably been hearing them too because this is a home jail. This is a home that he lived in, but it was a house jail. <clears throat> and so he knew these guys must have had some kind of authority and they probably caused this earthquake, okay? So what did he do? He goes up to them and said, what can I do, to, what must I do to be saved? And so they answer with the same answer that we get today. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you, can, you will be saved. You and your household. So um, Paul and Silas, so, so <clears throat> he does. Basically, Paul and Silas go and teach the family all about Christ, and they too accept Christ, and they're all baptized. All right? So now, Paul and Silas have been released from prison, and where did they go? Do you remember? They went to Lydia's house. house. Remember, they had led Lydia to the Lord. And they go to Lydia's house where all the brothers and sisters are there. And they encourage them, but then they leave because I think they promised the people, the authorities, that they would leave. So they leave and they go, they head toward Thessalonica. And that's where we pick it up today. Acts 17, verse 1. Who's got that? That's me. <clears throat> now, when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, Sounds like diseases. It does. Came to Thessalonica, where they were, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Okay, so they're headed to Thessalonica. Okay, uh, but here we see in the beginning of Acts 17 and Acts 16, Luke was always talking using the we and us pronouns. Okay, so Luke became part of this entourage when they were doing all that they were doing and heading into Europe. But now he's changed and he's using the the pronouns they okay so what what's happened is obviously Luke has stayed there in Philippi at, to 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 minister to those folks and the the Paul and Silas and Timothy are heading on to Thessalonica because he's using the, the pronoun they so it's and he now he's now not part of that group so he he has decided to stay on so as they leave Philip Philippi they passed through two towns on their way to Thessalonica, okay? First, they passed through Amphilopis, that's how you say it, Amphilopis, and, which is about 33 miles down the coast. And then they go through Ap Apollonia, and they go, they go to Apollonia, which is about 63 miles down the coast. And these were places which they stopped at, but we don't have any indication of what they did. Now, if you have your paper that I had given you, you have 
the journeys of um, Paul and his, uh, his missionary. And you can see that when they leave Philippi, they go to Thessalonica. And I put two dots on mine, and I don't know if yours has two dots, but that's where Amphilopis and Apollonia are. Okay? So they, so, um, they pass through those, through those towns. But then finally, they, they go about 37 more miles, and they reach Thessalonica. All right? And so now here they are in Thessalonica, and, and this is a town that was founded in 315 B.C., and this was the capital of Macedonia. It was named in honor of Philip II's daughter, Thessalonicus. And uh, she was obviously, since she was Philip II's daughter, this girl was the brother, or the sister, of Alexander the Great. Okay, this is Alexander the Great's sister. And this was a trading city of, that had about a little over 200,000 people in it. So it's a big city. And... and um, it was, it was there that three rivers come together and head into the, and go into the coast. So it's a very important port city. Um, also, the Ignatian Highway went right through Thessalonica. Now, the Ignatian Highway, the via, the, uh, what is it, the Via Ignatia, which is a road that the Romans built. It was, a, it was now, when the Romans built a road, it was paved. Okay? It was about 20 or 21 feet wide, but this road was 696 miles long. And this was a very important road because it went through northern Macedonia, it went through Greece, it went through, uh, it went through, um, uh, it went up into Turkey, and it went through Albania as well. So this was a very important road that connected Europe and Asia. Okay? So this road, all the traffic that went either from Europe to Asia or Asia to Europe went through Thessalonica. The city was a very important city, populated by Greeks, Romans, Jews, and Asians. So being such a large city, of course, where does Paul go first? He goes to the synagogue. Yeah, he goes to the synagogue first. That's, that, that, was, that was what he always did when one was available. So let's look at the next two verses, verse 2 and 3, and see what that says. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the <coughs> Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, This <coughs> Jesus, who I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. All right, so Paul always starts his ministry in the synagogue when there was one there. When there wasn't one, he would find out where the Jews would meet. And that's how he met these women back in, uh, back in Philippi. But um, that now he's, uh, he went to the synagogue and he found the people there. Why, why would he go to the synagogue first, do you think? Why would he go there first? That's where the Jews were. Where the Jew, obviously the Jews are, but why would he, why would he go to the Jews? He was preaching Jesus, and they didn't know Jesus. They didn't know Jesus, but they so knew they the Hebrew Scriptures, didn't they? They not only knew the Hebrew Scriptures, they were looking for the Messiah, weren't they, to come. So see, he's going to the synagogue because these are the people who are looking for a Messiah. Okay? So, what is a synagogue? It's not a temple, but it's a smaller place where Jews would go and meet. And it was during that time when the Jews had no prophets that were on in the land. That was a 400-year period between Malachi and John the Baptist. Okay, that 400-year, the the Hebrew people wanted to learn what God was trying to tell them, and they didn't have a prophet to tell them. So the Jews started this synagogue system, and the synagogue system offered a unique opportunity for making the Hebrew scriptures available to all the people who were dispersed all over the world. And in a synagogue, they would read the Tanaka, they would pray, and they would try to make some application to their own lives about what it was saying. Kind of sounds like what we do in our churches today, doesn't it? And that's what they were doing. It's like our churches, the synagogues were formed. It was like church, Jewish churches, so they would, know, they would hear what the scriptures were telling them. So did the synagogues have rabbis? They had, they had leaders, yes, and that would be the, the rabbis eventually became the leaders of the synagogue. Yeah. And that's how the rabbi, the whole rabbi system started then. Yeah. The so, rabbi is actually a teacher. A rabbi is a teacher, a that's right. Yeah. 
And that's why they would call Jesus a rabbi, too, because he had followers and, and disciples. Who, who, that's right. Scholar as opposed to that's right. Worship leader. Yeah. So this is how the synagogue system started. And there was a synagogue wherever there were 10 Jewish men there in, in the city. Because no less than seven men would be called on to read portions of the scripture. And the ruler of the synagogue would then call on a competent or distinguished person in their congregation or himself or a visitor. They would, they would, they would call on a distinguished visitor to speak. And this is how Jesus and the apostles were able, how they get, were able to use this to their advantage when they would go to the synagogues and they would be able to preach the gospel in these synagogues. Because if you remember, Jesus was at the synagogue in, um, was it in uh, Nazareth, when he, he first came out and he read the scripture that was talking about the Messiah coming. And he said, this has happened in your hearing. So see, this is, they were able to preach the gospel in the synagogues and that, that was so good. And that's what Paul is doing. And we see from these verses here, the verses that, that, um, that Roger read, that it says that Paul and his missionary team were there for three Sabbaths. So they were there for uh, three weeks, I'm guessing. But when you look at how three is used in Scripture, a lot of times the, the word three is used to mean complete. And they use two to mean a few. So we know that they were there for at least three weeks. And it might have been longer because they were there until the, the um, ministry or the, the, their time there was completed. So we know it was at least three weeks, but it might have been longer. Okay? And it's, the scripture here tells us that Paul reasoned with them from the scriptures. Now, reason is the Greek word dialog dialogmai. And dialogmai means to say, to say something thoroughly, to discuss, to dispute, or to reason. Okay, this word comes from, this is where we get our word dialogue, which is talking back and forth, isn't it? And the dialegami was actually, the, well, that was Socrates' method of teaching. Socrates and Plato, they would teach by dialoguing back and forth. The, uh, they would give out questions, questions were brought back to them, and then they would throw back questions again to make their students think. And this is what Paul is doing. He's not just, he's not just teaching. He's dialoguing. He's reasoning with these people. He's answering their questions, and they are, ans they are asking questions back. And the word dialegami was written in the imperfect tense. And what that tells us is that, that there were repeated questions. This was done repeatedly. So, Paul is using a method, the this, this Socrates' method of teaching, by asking questions and answering questions. I think that is where our style of debate comes. It is, yeah. They would teach, but they would, the audience would be skeptical, so they would, they would debate with their information, and it had to be refuted through a debate process. Right, and that's exactly what Paul is doing here. He's, he's allowing them to speak and ask questions, and yes, he's debating with them, absolutely. And see, it's more than just teaching. And that's what's so important. When you, when you look at the Greek, you can know exactly how they, are, how they are, are, are doing this. And they're doing this repeated questions. And this interchange between Paul and the people wasn't just preaching. It was great discussion that was going on. So, so that's what's happening here. And verse 3 tells us that Paul was explaining and giving evidence about Jesus' suffering and suffering, dying, and then rising from the dead. All right? So now the word explaining there is the Greek word dienigo. De, and I'm not, I know I'm not saying that right, but dienigo means to open thoroughly. Now Luke uses this word in, in his gospel, dienigo. And he used it in his gospel when he spoke of God opening the eyes of the two men on the, on the road to Emmaus. Remember when they were walking along with Jesus and they didn't know who he was. And Jesus was opening the scriptures to them. And they, they were listening to him. He was talking about all the, all the scriptures and how it pointed up to him. And then when he broke the bread, if you remember, God opened their eyes to who this man was. And they realized, that's him. That's Jesus. We were with Jesus. 
but they didn't know until God opened their eyes, the enigo, till he opened their eyes. And that's what Paul's doing for these people. He's opening, God's using him to open their eyes to the truth of the scripture. And then he's also giving evidence. Now giving evidence is the Greek word paratithomai, something like that, whatever. It it's, 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 means to place before or alongside. And uh, what here, here, what here, what's happening? It, it was taking, it was, it was the taking of what we know as messianic prophecies, and putting them alongside the events and life, in this case, of Jesus. And that's what Paul is doing. He's looking at the scripture, and he's putting him alongside Jesus, and showing them how all of it was fulfilled in him as the Christ. Yeah, Tom. I was kind of going back to this, but context would be that he uses the word synagogue, which is more like a, a teaching environment, like a Sunday school. Exactly. They would be following the temple service, which is led by the priests as the worship. So that's what the context of the synagogue and the debate and, and, the, mm -hmm. and Paul giving, the, <coughs> giving them a chance to, you know, he, he can overcome their arguments in that kind of contextual environment, as opposed to a lecture, which would be yeah, and that's exactly what he's doing. He's exact. There, there, there is give and take here. Yeah, and and they're asking questions, and he's and what he's doing is he is taking one well, their questions, and he's taking the scripture, and he's opening their eyes and explaining to them how this all points to Jesus. Okay, and and he's at the synagogue because they're looking for the Messiah, aren't they? And so this is what he's doing. Why did they allow him in the synagogue if he was a Jewish synagogue? How did what? Why did they allow Paul Paul in when they knew he was not a devout Jew and he was preaching something that was opposed well, to would, what they were doing? I would argue that he was because he was a, I mean, he was a biblical, I mean, he was a scholar too. I mean, yep. I mean, he was. He was I mean, but again, it's, it's not the <coughs> service where you wouldn't want to, during a sermon, be arguing with Sean, but in, in a Sunday school environment, a synagogue environment, it's, it's a discussion thing, and it's open, more open. We have visitors come in, and people can talk. That's, that's so he wasn't like, just the teacher up front. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and I guess, I mean, it, I would argue that he is a scholar, but to your point, I, I think it, it's... I mean, if they've heard that he's going around doing this, then why would they be as accepting of him to come in? Well, see, I don't do think that. they knew much about him yet. That's the problem. Yeah, they don't know. Exactly. They just know he's a Maybe scholar. His reputation didn't. Yeah, his rep <laughs> but his reputation hadn't met up with. Yeah, they, it hadn't. So, so there he's wasn't able. On the internet. To, to there was no internet. There was no internet. No, no. He wasn't letting him. He's like a guest no. speaker. You know? Yeah. He was a guest speaker. So okay. If you were gone or something. And, and, and what he's doing is he, he's now showing them how the scriptures are pointing to this man, Jesus, okay, as being the Messiah. So, but what's the biggest problem that the Jews had with Jesus being the Messiah? What's the biggest problem, do you think, that the Jews had with Jesus actually being the Messiah? They expected an earthly king. They were expecting an earthly king. But they were jealous. I mean, they were jealous that... Okay, well, what was their biggest problem with Jesus, though? He wasn't military. Probably. He wasn't military. Absolutely, he wasn't military. What else? He was upsetting the balance of power. He totally was upsetting the balance of power. But he was also killed. Jesus was crucified. He died. Okay? He died. And they couldn't conceive of a dead Messiah. Because the Messiah is not going to die. The Messiah is going, Messiah is going to be victorious over um, over Rome, wasn't he? He was going to deliver them from Roman oppression. Deliverance through conquest. But they couldn't conceive of a dead Messiah. The Messiah's not going to die. The Messiah's going to save us, right? So th this is one of the problems they have. And Paul actually brings up the fact that Jesus died often. Let's look at, let's look at 1 Corinthians 1.18. Who's got that? You got that? Before we get there... Uh... <coughs> I think you got to notice that verse one insinuates that he went intentionally to a place that had a synagogue. Oh, he did. No, he's always going to the synagogues. Yeah, when and he can. I remember he just pulled off some really cool miracles. You reckon these folks hadn't heard about it? Or well, he's wouldn't he, they want to? Well, he's a hundred and something miles away, so I don't know if word that? got that far yet. <laughs> who knows? But it is all on that road, so who knows? Maybe they had had word. I don't. We don't know. So anyway, uh, <coughs> uh, for the word, of, well, let me bet it's got. 
Don't worry about that. I'm going to go back this way. <laughs> uh, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Okay, so what word did I leave off there? Uh, you just said, who are perishing foolishness. <laughs> oh, it's that, that, that would, oh, okay, well, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, because my version says, for the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. I didn't read that. Apparently, it's, it was, it's on mine, so I don't know how to, I didn't print that. But okay, for the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. Now, what is the word of the cross? Okay, word is the Greek word logos, okay, and that means word. But what, what are we talking about? The word of the cross. What is the word of the cross? Well, when you look up logos and you, 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 exa you, just, you look at what it means, it can actually mean divine revelation or divine account. Okay? It's more than just word. So, the divine, so what Paul is saying here is the divine account, the divine revelation of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. Now, who is perishing? Those who haven't believed. Those who don't believe. Jews, everybody who doesn't believe, right? To the, for the, the word, for the message, let's call it the message of the cross. The message of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it's what? The power of God. And who's being saved? Those who trust in Jesus. Those who believe Jesus is the Messiah. So, um, so he, what he's saying is for the word of the cross, the message of the cross... It's to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. And then he keeps on going in his, in his discourse, and we'll, uh, a couple of verses later, verse 22 and 23, let's see what he says there. For indeed, indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to Jews a stumbling block, and to Gentiles foolishness. Yeah, I mean, for indeed, Jews... Ask for signs, and Greeks ask, they, they search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. That means we preach that the Messiah was actually crucified, to, which to the Jews is a stumbling block. And to the, to the Gentiles, they call it foolishness. But we actually know it happened because we've seen him dead. We see he died, and he was buried and we've seen the resurrected Jesus. So he's, he's saying, we, we know that this has happened. And Jesus himself even taught his disciples that this was going to happen. As they were going into Jerusalem for that last time, for that last week of Jesus' earthly life, Jesus stops along the road and he, he speaks to his disciples. And let's read that, Luke 18, verses 31 through 33. And he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him, and the third day he will rise again. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they're coming into Jerusalem, and I think it's just before they get there. They're stopping. They see, they see the temple on, on, in, in the, the valley. Or on, up on the hill, and and, he, and Jesus stops and he says, he says, "Behold, guys, we're going to go into Jerusalem." He said, "And all the things that were written by the prophets about the Messiah are about to happen." He said, "This is all going to happen." He said, "The Messiah will be, um, he will be um, delivered to the Gentiles. He will be mocked. He will be spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they are going to kill him." And then on the third day, he's going to rise from the dead. Now, you know, these guys are here with Jesus, so they obviously understand what he's talking about, don't they? No, absolutely not. Let's look at the next verse, verse 34. And they understood none of these things, and this saying was said from them, and they did not comprehend the things that were said. Yeah, and we're no different than them. Without the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't understand at all what Jesus was, was speaking, because obviously he's the Messiah, and the Messiah is not going to die. The Messiah, they're still expecting this victorious um, general or whatever who's going to take over the Romans, right? And he is, but in a different way, right? All right, so the disciples had no idea what Jesus was talking about, and I don't think any of us would have either. I'm not sure anybody understands at that point what the scriptures were talking about. But you know, they were familiar with the suffering servant that we, that we see of in Isaiah 53, 
but they still didn't understand that the suffering and death of the Messiah, well, of the Messiah, was a must. It had to happen. It was a divine necessity, which is what Paul talks about, as was the resurrection from the dead. So here you've got Paul in the synagogue preaching to these Jews, that, and he's declaring to them, the scripture tells us that the Messiah must suffer. He must die, and he must rise from the dead. And, he, and he's showing them how Jesus modeled these characteristics in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection. Therefore, Jesus must be the Messiah. And that's what Paul is doing. You know, the most convincing arguments for the truth of who Jesus Christ is are the, abs are the, are the absolute and total fulfillment of prophecy. And Jesus, uh, over 1,000 prophecies were fulfilled in, in Jesus' life, in, the, in, in his first coming. And so Paul continues to dialogue with these Jews in the synagogue, and he declares that there is no salvation through Judaism, there's no salvation through Roman philosophy. There's no salvation through the many mysterious religions of that day. That salvation was, and folks, and still is, found only in Jesus Christ, the Messiah of God, whom the Jews had rejected at, well, when he walked the earth. And that's what Paul's telling them. But Jesus proved who he was when his resurrected person walked the earth after he'd been killed. All right, so let's go on to Acts 17, verse 4. And some, of them, <coughs> and some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a great multitude of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. Yeah, so here we've got some of them were persuaded. Who's the them? Jews. The Jews. Here we are at a synagogue. So these are the, the Jews. Some of them were persuaded. Now, persuaded is the Greek word pitho, and pitho means convinced by argument or have confidence in. So God through Paul, had convinced the Jews that, um, that had convinced the Jews about this. But not only that, but he, he'd also convinced a great number of the, um, a great multitude of the God-fearing Greeks. So there were a lot of proselytes there, too. There were, there were Gentiles there, and they, they, they were convinced that the, that the Messiah was coming. So he was convincing them as well. But who else did he convince? A, a, a number of the leading women. Okay, now, um, women, for the most part, in the first century were, were little more than slaves. Okay, sorry about that, but they were. But in Asia, in Asia Minor and in Macedonia, prominent women had the freedom that was not known in the rest of the world, or in, in, in that part of the world. So these women were probably wives of important officials, important residents, and they were probably of a wealthy status. Yes, they probably were. But they were held in high esteem and respect. And just like the men who were persuaded, so these women were also, oh, their hearts were open to the Lord that very morning. So, um, so we're, seeing, we're seeing Jews, Greeks, and men and women coming to Christ here. All right, so let's go on to verse 5. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And coming upon the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. Yeah, it seems that like every time Paul finishes teaching in synagogues and people are coming to Christ, we read the words, but the Jews. We seem to see that a lot. I mean, it happened in Pisidian Antioch, it happened in Iconium, and in Lystra on Paul's first missionary journey. And now we're seeing it here on a second missionary journey. It's happening again. Paul is opposed by a mob of incited Jews. Now, so who were these Jews that were angry, so anger, angered and were so jealous? The, or, or should, not who, but why? Why were these Jews so angered and jealous, at what Paul was saying? What do you think? Because they were popular? They were popular, that's part of it, yeah. They were disrupting the whole status quo of the Jewish community. They were. Because uh, who, who, who were they proclaiming? Uh, who were they proclaiming? Jesus, Jesus right? Is and who is he? Messiah. He's the Messiah. Now, what makes this guy the Messiah? Wait a minute. I mean, you're, and you're, you're, we're Jews, and God is our God, and you're saying now that the, Salvation is available to Gentiles? Come on. And Gentile and, and women too? 
I mean, th this is the things they, they were upset. They were upset with what Paul was telling them. Um, well, Scripture tells us that these angry Jews, they take along some wicked men from the mar mar marketplace to form a mob. Now, who are these wicked men that they're getting? All right, let's look at this. These men are described as wicked here, but there really doesn't tell us much about them because it's the Greek word pon ponerus. And ponerus means, uh, it, it basically means um, wicked, bad, evil, um, degenerate, or vicious. Okay? Yeah, um, these, these are not good people that they went to the marketplace to get. The King James Version describes them as the baser set. Yeah, Tom. Me again. Uh, I'm thinking this is a group of Hebrews in a community largely of Gentiles. That's right, largely of Gentiles. So what yep. made the Christian, potentially Christian followers, so much more threatening to the Hebrew community than the Gentiles? Don't I don't know. Yeah, but they but they wanted to get rid of these men, right? So they go to the marketplace. It's pure bigotry. Yeah, it is. And but they wanted to get rid of these people because they don't believe what they're saying. And they want, they want to get rid of them, so they go get these terrible people out of the marketplace. Okay? They didn't believe the Gentiles that believed in Zeus and That's right. Apollo either. So. Yep. So, so they get these people who, uh, the king, I like the kid, what the King James Version says, the baser set, because the baser set actually refers to a person not adhering to any ethical or moral principles. So that's the kind of person they're looking for. And so they, these people show no honor or morality. So these unbelieving Jews go out to the marketplace and find some really low-life people. And they form this mob. And they head over to Jason's house. Now, I don't know who Jason was. We have no idea who Jason was. But Jason had to have been one of those people that accepted what Paul and Silas and Timothy were telling them. So they're going to Jason's house because that's where these missionaries were. They knew it. And that's where we're going to start off next week. Because we're running out of time here. I know you guys got to get to, to service. But um, let's let's close there, and we'll get to it next week. Yeah? You might want to turn that off.